Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Um, my name's John Dixon. I'm from UK. Uh, DEFRA, that's the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, I'm your chair this morning. Um, are you all enjoying the conference so far? Yeah, yeah very good, very good. Um, it's a lot of competition, so a, a lot of very interesting sessions on this morning, um, so it's nice to see that we've got a, a quite a full house here. Um, our first speaker is uh, Mick Corey from Euro, Euro Geographics, and Mick is going to talk about building on inspiring the need for a pan European geospatial data service. So, Mick, um, please. Thank you, John. Um, how's this? What do I do here? Do I just press mm. down? Is that the idea? So, is this the zero in the room? I don't know where my. Ah, okay. Okay. Mike um. Corey. Thank you and good morning. Um, I think I can say at a conference like this that uh, we all love maps. And I've worked in mapping for maybe 40 years. I know I don't look it, but uh, truly. <laughs> and I love maps. But what I've come to learn in all of this time is that maps aren't important. Let me explain this to you in the next 15 minutes or so. There is certainly a fascination about maps, whether it's an old map or indeed a modern map. Maps come in many different forms and they inform and communicate in many different and often beautiful ways. And today we are seeing the introduction of new ways to visualize and depict the world around us. And of course, these are still models of the real world. And although not a traditional two-dimensional model on a paper map, nevertheless, they are still a map. However, what is important is that although we may all love maps, the reality is that maps are not important. It's what they are used for that is important. And globalization has increased this importance. My talk will highlight how maps contribute to the important issues of today. And that these important issues are global and international in nature. These international issues must be solved by collaboration and cooperation. To solve them requires pan-national data to inform the important decisions required. To create such pan-national requirements, and data, it's not just about technical collaboration, such as that which we experience here today and during the week at the INSPIRE conference, but also cooperation and collaboration across a number of other dimensions. But first, what are the important issues of the day? We have the environment, we have transportation, we have security, and we have the economy. Environmental issues do not stop at national borders. The Alps is a very good example. They cover six different countries, and as an important ecological system, the management, protection, and enhancement of the Alpine region demands not only strong collaboration, but good data and good information. That information must be easily obtained it must be relied on, and that it is compatible across the different national systems involved. Transportation systems are increasingly international, and again, they rely on compatible and comparable data across borders to ensure that an integrated transportation system can be planned, managed, and improved into the future. Something that will become even more important as we approach the era of automated vehicles. 
Responding to national and man-made disasters requires a collaborative effort with internationally compatible data and information. This map shows the deposition of nuclear fallout of the Chernobyl accident and nuclear tests. The higher levels are mostly as the result of Chernobyl. And humanitarian efforts extend across borders into security concerns and also require international response by in, and informed by international compatible data. Europe today has many cross-border problems, from refugees, terrorism, to organized crime. Responding and fighting these problems requires society to organize itself and its data. This response needs pan-European data sets. Economic issues trouble all parts of Europe in different ways. For example, unemployment in Europe is depicted on this map. It shows the different unemployment rates in different parts of Europe, broken down by region rather than by country. It underscores the difficulty that European policymakers have in forming an appropriate response to the continent's economic challenges. A monetary policy that stimulates Spain or Greece would badly overheat Austria and Netherlands. At the same time, northern and southern Italy look quite distinct, and former East Germany looks a lot more like Poland than it does the rest of Europe. So we have many drivers for a European location service. There are global drivers as well, such as the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. There are European drivers coming from the European Union, but not unique to the EU. There are, and will remain, national drivers. And then there are market drivers, although the demand for pan-European data in the market is still not clear. These demands, we believe, are unfulfilled. Although there are commercial and voluntary data out there, and that they can be used to partially meet these demands, they are not yet and may never be able to fulfill the need for official <coughs> authoritative data from those charged by their governments to produce it. At the global level, the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognizes the importance of geospatial information from official national sources. These will help monitor and review progress in meeting the global challenge of eradicating poverty in all of its forms. It explicitly aims to exploit the contribution of a wide range of data, and in particular data from official national sources, to support high-level decision-making and policy development. For example, authoritative data is the basis for identifying and understanding the level of risk to national and man-made disaster. It will help in emergency response in the time of a crisis, and it will aid recovery and other actions following a disaster. Accurate, detailed, and trusted geospatial data supports high-level decision-making and policy development at the European level, too. Evidence-based policy should rely on definitive, authoritative data from official national data providers. Such a service can meet a number of key European Commission policy priorities, specifically the four highlighted here in yellow. For example, by enabling the development of pan-European applications by small businesses, helping to promote innovation and boost jobs, growth and investment by offering data on which new applications can be developed. It helps address the significant climate change challenges affecting all of us. It addresses the priority of creating a connected digital single market. And it supports the area of justice and fundamental human rights by providing an online resource to identify properties and link to systems that provide information about property ownership and other property-based rights. Inspire has helped begin to address the technical aspects of bringing together diverse data from different national sources. But there remain a number of other challenges. These need to be addressed. Across Europe today, 
there remain diverse legal, financial and business models. Inspire may have created an interoperable technical infrastructure, but there is as yet no interoperable legal framework within which this data can be licensed. There is no agreed business model for finance in the use of such data, and there remains many different approaches to pricing and licensing such data. There are even many different interpretations of what is meant by open data. When we overlay this diversity with the fact that each country has its own priorities, which may not align to pan-European priorities, whether these are European Union priorities or indeed wider international ones. Each country applies different licensing restrictions. Such may, some may be restrictive, others far more open. However, the very difference creates a challenge when we are trying to create a pan-European service. While there are many advantages that come from Inspire, there are also many challenges. We depend on this technically complex specification, and again, many interpret these specifications differently. A challenge when bringing the data together for a pan-European service. Some also say that the Inspire approach is too complex for what the market actually requires, and this adds to the challenge in an unproven market requirement. And not least, there are a number of organizational and resourcing issues. How will, how will we organize such a service, and how will it be funded? Eurogeographics is the association of European national mapping, cadastral, and land registration authorities. We are working towards creating an operational European location service. This will provide a single access point to official quality assured data from Europe's official providers, providing authoritative pan-European data content through services that complement but do not compete with the existing national services which have been developed to meet Inspire directive requirements. <coughs> We're doing this because it's our role and we want and our members want to contribute to the wider public good. However, we cannot do this alone. We will need to work in partnership with a number of other actors to help make this happen. The European Location Service will support member states' ability to meet their national policy obligations to the European Union. It complements their activities and provides them with a means to meet their obligations to supply their data and their services in a global marketplace. The maintenance of an accurate, detailed and trusted geospatial information base I believe will remain the role of governments and their national mapping and land registration cadastral authorities. Such a service will make core Inspire reference data available to meet the needs of the European Commission and its institutions. It will meet the needs for sustainable and reliable access to in situ data. <coughs> this is also an, a practical example of Inspire. And we cannot assume that the public sector has all the skills necessary to develop the operational service. There are commercial and other competencies that the private sector has, as well as the ability to move fast, react to customer demands, and to enter into commercial relationships that the public sector cannot always respond to. So in closing, maps are not of themselves important. Sorry, maybe lost slides. That's okay. It's a blank slide. <laughs> so in closing, Maps are not of themselves important. Although they are beautiful and interesting, how they are used is important, and in particular how they are used to develop and address the important and ever-increasing global issues of today, such as the environment, security, transport and the economy. That they are used in these issues is perhaps not surprising, but such uses do not stop at national borders, just as extreme weather doesn't stop at borders. So consistent, official and trustworthy sources of pan-European mapping is important, essential and even critical in some cases. To create such data, we believe, uh, requires significantly more than just a technical solution. We still need to address legal, business and organisational issues. In Eurogeographics, we believe that the best approach to create a future in which society is informed 
by our members' geospatial information is to create that future. We know we can't do this alone. We're looking to work in partnership with others to ensure that we can do this effectively. Only then may we begin to see truly useful, informative and even beautiful maps that inform and empower society and help us manage the global challenges of today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mick. Um, some really interesting points there. I, I, sorry, I just want to um, stop at the podium so we can maybe, maybe take some questions. Um, uh, I, I think you, you made some very interesting points there, some of which could probably be five-day conferences in themselves. I, I'm thinking uh, you just you alluded to where does government step in, um, which I, I think is, is a, a very interesting question. Um, another point you made that I would just like to ask if you could elaborate very slightly on, I mean, again, it's probably uh, a whole day of a, a session, but you, you, um, you mentioned um, Inspire being too complicated to meet market needs. I wondered if there's any just brief insights you could share on that point. Well, does anyone believe it isn't technically complex? Because it is. And um, it has the specifications produced by technical experts, and rightly so. But the user, at the end of the day, has to be able to access this information and use it simply. And there is evidence to suggest that they are quite happy to use some much simpler uh, formats, I mean, shapefiles or, or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Mm -hmm. And so there is a bit of a gap there. And although clearly Inspire wants to try to future-proof things, and even expand that complexity, perhaps, and that's important. Experience shows that you also have to recognize what users actually want and respond to that. And that creates a challenge, not just for uh, Inspire, but also for our members who have to respond to those requirements. Yeah. And Inspire at the moment, in some cases, is built on national systems as an add-on rather than as a core activity because of this. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Thanks, Mick. Um, are there any questions from the floor for Mick? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Jan-Nick Bulens from Wageningen University and Research. Um, in the light of uh, developments in the open data domain and in the crowdsourcing domain, and because we have thinking now out of the box, what, what to your opinion or what are the discussions within your geographics about the value of authoritative data in the future? So will it be diminishing? Will it be more directed like products like OpenStreetMaps and that kind of things? Well, I don't think it re these replace the need for authoritative data. Because when we look across Europe, and it, it varies, some countries' legal frameworks require official data for certain official purposes. And there, there are many reasons, some of it historic, some of it cultural, for that. But it's important in the sense of justice and so on. So although there's a role for voluntary geographic information, for example, I think that there remains a role for government to authorize and create trusted sources on which official information and official decisions have to be taken. Um, I don't see it as a, as a something that is instead of, because in reality, you know, in the long term, the maintenance of such data sources becomes a challenge. And indeed, the coverage of such sources is also a challenge. Would you still be able to, to obtain information at the same quality and currency in some remoter parts of Europe than in, say, the center of cities? Is it still going to be of the same quality? And national requirements require that consistency as well as currency. And as I say, at the end of the day, it has to be trusted. I think the challenge for our members is actually how we can bring some of that information in and enable that to improve the general base. And that, I think, is uh, a challenge for our members, for sure. Thank you for your presentation. Antonio Alzarena from the National Mapping Agency of Spain in Madrid. Well, regarding the Copernicus services, which is your opinion about the role of the different member states and also, of course, of the geographics 
in order to facilitate the in-situ data for the member states. Thank you. Copernicus regulation actually requires the Copernicus system to use in situ data from official sources where it's available and therefore we are working very hard to try to ensure that the services have access to those services and in, in, in terms that may enable it to be used in the way that they inspire to. There are many challenges. We, we've recently set up a, a Copernicus knowledge exchange network we have a formal partnership with the European Environment Agency to progress collaboration in this field. We've also facilitated the signing of uh, licenses to make available official data in times of an emergency crisis from across Europe. And I think we have something like 30 countries signed up to that at the moment. So the, to answer your question specifically, it's fundamental that in situ data includes the data from our members, fundamental. Um, secondly, we're working to create a, a relationship and partnership with the EA to make sure that that happens. And thirdly, we've put in actual agreements to allow the access of our data. Okay, uh, thanks. I think we should leave it there, but um, could I just ask, is Roberto Lucci in the room? Um, he's our last speaker today. Um, uh, we, we could take a few more questions if, if it appears that Roberto's not here. Yes, he will come. Yeah? Because he's busy maybe in another presentation. Okay. Yeah, I, I just checked. He doesn't appear to be pre presenting elsewhere, but um, he will come. Okay. Um, thanks, Mick. Um, our next speaker this morning is uh, Emilio Lopez. Um, he's going to talk about Spanish good and not so good practices implementing Inspire. Hey, thank you. Thank you for being here. I am Emilio Lopez from the National Center of Geographic Information. Uh, my department is in charge of BIM, the National Contact Point for Inspire, uh, for coordinating the national SDI and uh, for implementing Inspire using the National Geographic Institute products. Okay, so I am going to show you five best practices with some advantages and some issues. Okay, I am going to speak uh, as fast as possible because uh, I have 39 uh, slides. Okay, so uh, the first thing, uh, the first uh, good practice, we have a plan, a very good plan, uh, uh, so we are able to cover all the Spanish territory uh, uh, with <coughs> orthophotos at 25 and 50 centimeters uh, resolutions uh, each three years. And uh, another uh, part of this project, uh, we are covering with LiDAR data each six year. Uh, we started uh, uh, with orthophotos in 2004. Uh, right, we, here, uh, we have here the father of the project, that is uh, Antonio Rosarena, uh, and this is a, a very important project that gives us uh, a lot of information. Okay, so good things. We are the, the most important thing of this project is that we are doing, uh, we are getting this information, cooperating with other uh, institutions at national level. For instance, Cadaster and Agriculture Department, they are uh, very key actors but also with uh, regions that they are co-funding and in some cases they are capturing the information. And because it's a success, we are using this process for other uh, data, not only for, orto we started with orthophotos, but now we are using this uh, process for satellite uh, images, LIDAR, land use, land cover, and so on. So it's a, a um, very big success and in fact uh, we receive uh, an award from the United uh, Nations as a, a, a good uh, practice. But every year Antonio and his team they have to reach agreement with 
other organizations try to pursue them to uh, to uh, provide money to provide budget uh, to uh, obtain again the images so we need a comprehensive uh, budget plan from the uh, budget of the uh, of the national um, of the state okay and uh, we are uh, starting to think because this is good for raster data uh, perhaps we is a good idea to use for vector data okay for hydrography transport network and and so on and i think uh, from my point of view that sometimes uh, we are not able to use all this information and to take uh, the benefits that uh, uh, is possible to, to get, or I guess it's possible to, to get. For instance, uh, there are some orthophotos that we are not using for updating our maps, because we are not able to, to use all this information. Okay. Uh, I, I am going to, uh, I try to organize the best practice from the capture of information to uh, our relationship with the users. Okay, second, the reference geographic information. Uh, my former boss say the map has died, no life the geographic information. Okay, and I think that it is a, a good idea. Okay, so uh, we decided uh, two or three years ago, we decided to change uh, the process, uh, the, mm, yes, the process of production of uh, maps in, in our uh, organization. So the former production process, uh, we capture information, orthophotos, vector data, and so on, and we uh, generate a topographic database. This, the characteristics of this topographic database, no topology, only two dimensions, it's split it into seats, and uh, we maintain several uh, scales. And with this topographic database, uh, uh, we get we, the outputs uh, were paper maps, files for the load, for the loading, and uh, web services. But we have decided to change, and now we capture more uh, data, not only orthophotos and vector data, but uh, LiDAR data or land use and land cover data, and we create something similar to Inspire database, okay? This database has a topology, we create networks, it's three-dimensional, we try to get uh, the best resolution we are able to, uh, to obtain, uh, we have improved the quality control uh, process, and, well, it's not Inspire compliant, but it's easy to obtain uh, data sets and services inspire compliant because it's oriented okay and now the topographic database is a product is an output of, of this database it's not the, the center <coughs> of the process but always but uh, last year we have focused all our energy all our resources human and economic resources in trying to change the process and now Nowadays, our database are a little obsolete, okay? And uh, our addresses database, uh, we have um, some GRs in some municipalities, the data are very obsolete. We have maps with more than 10 GRs, so the, the new challenge for uh, next year is to, to use the new process to update uh, uh, our products and our information. Okay, fair best practice, open data. Okay, uh, we, uh, in 2015, we open our data totally for any purpose, commercial and non-commercial. And uh, I think that it is a very good uh, figure, about 8.5 millions of uh, files downloaded in the six first month of this year. Uh, this gives us more visibility. There are more people using uh, uh, our information. Citizens, uh, uh, public companies, uh, private companies, uh, big companies, medium companies, small companies using our, our information. 
So year after year, we are providing more downloads and more data. For instance, uh, we have included uh, LiDAR data in last year. We have included all uh, photos, uh, all maps, and uh, now uh, there are a quite range of data sets that uh, you uh, can obtain from our download data center. And we have improved this download uh, data center with more functionalities. You, for instance, you uh, can draw a polygon and you can get everything, every product of, of, this, uh, pro, uh, of this region only uh, with a click. But now uh, we, we are not uh, able to get uh, financial returns from uh, this data. Okay, well, this is a, a, a problem. And the second one is when you open your data for everyone, uh, you don't need to register in the uh, website. You don't know exactly uh, nothing about your users. Okay, so because you, you don't know uh, who is, how, uh, how um, uh, are they, so you miss some very important information about your user in order to uh, to do a plan for, for them, to improve your services. Fourth, uh, best practice, implementing Inspire, in particular services. Okay, so I, I'm not sure if this is a, a good idea, but it's what we are doing uh, right now. It's, as much as possible, we don't implement Inspire services and national services. We try to adapt national services to be Inspire compliant. Because I think that in Spain, or at least in the National Geographic Institute, we are Inspire supporter. Almost Inspire hooligans. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes more than the commission, I, I, I think. Okay, so uh, we don't know to create Inspire services for the commission. We want to, to create Inspire services for all our users. So uh, we have uh, nowadays 18 uh, services, Inspire services. You can think that it's not a, a, a huge figure, okay? But I can say that uh, we have open services. These 18 services are open. These 18 services cover the whole Spanish territory and they provide information from nine inspired themes. We have only one uh, hydrography service, view service, and only one uh, hydrography uh, feature service, okay? But it covers the whole territory at a quite high uh, resolution. We have only one uh, transport network view service, and we have only one uh, um, transport network uh, feature service, but it covers the whole territory including street names, okay? A little obsolete, but uh, the whole territory. So I think that uh, this is very useful, uh, not only for Spain, but uh, also uh, for the European Commission. And this is the figures uh, from our web map tile services. We are providing uh, around 400 million tiles, very small uh, images, okay? But 400 million times, every month to the users. But about well, the web map, uh, web map services, well, we receive uh, several millions of uh, requests every month, but our web feature services are not used, okay? Only uh, we receive a few requests. So we have to, to improve the use of our inspired services allow uh, at least about uh, the, the number of requests of our inspired download uh, services. Okay, well, this is uh, an uh, anecdote because uh, the land register has written in a resolution in our official bulletin that if you want to modify uh, um, a parcel in the register, you have to provide a GML file. It's incredible, it's incredible because we are talking that uh, uh, you here 
lawyers about uh, talking about GML. Okay, it's quite impressive. Sorry, uh, Frank, but <laughs> okay. Finally, uh, best practice working with with other providers and, and users. So we have good practices. There are some examples of our ministry, the Ministry of Public Works, using our services. I am uh, uh, showing, uh, I show uh, in this slide uh, s several viewers using uh, our inspired services, but uh, they use uh, our information uh, for the inventory or um, internally, okay, as well. This is a viewer in the Ministry of Industry, a, a viewer uh, in the Ministry of Environment providing uh, information about air quality. Okay, this is a, a website, a private website uh, for uh, hiking and for tracking. Okay, uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the users can use uh, Google Maps, but they can use our topographic maps is better, okay? And uh, uh, what happened with uh, organizations like OpenStreetMaps? Because the traffic department, they are using OpenStreetMap instead of uh, our services. One year ago, they were using Google Maps. So I don't know if this is a good movement or bad movement, I don't know. And now you can choose our services, but by default, they are using OpenStreetMaps. For me, it's a problem, or at least it's an issue. The Commission has the same issue, okay? It's not very difficult to find uh, websites from the Commission using OpenStreetMap instead of aerogeographic maps. I think that it's better. I, I would rather prefer this. Okay, so about OpenStreetMap and this type of uh, open providers or private uh, providers, uh, I think that sometimes they are playing our role. It's not their guilty, it's our responsibility because they are, uh, uh, the people use what uh, they prefer, okay? It's uh, their election. Sometimes they have very strict uh, data licenses and in the case of Spain, they are using our data from uh, because they are open, but it's very high uh, if you try to find the attribution that this data uh, uh, came from uh, the National Geographic Institute. But of course, there are some benefits. Uh, for instance, uh, OpenStreetMap, I think that is the most important volunteer uh, geographic information source. Okay, so we can benefit to provide uh, uh, the uh, information uh, to them and to get information from, from them to improve uh, our data sets. Okay, and we can reuse uh, their software. In fact, we, ha uh, we are now, uh, we have a contract for doing this, to try to, uh, to transform our inspired data sets in the OpenStreetMap uh, uh, data set in their model and to try to exchange information between both uh, uh, between both uh, data sets okay uh, finally uh, about the future uh, this is a, a a national park in spain using google earth and this is a 3 ds thing using our orthophotos i think that uh, there are some parts that uh, we are very competitive okay and uh, 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 we can provide better services. And other is about vector tiles, about semantic web. This is not uh, ideas, okay? Throwing ideas uh, uh, to the sky. We are working on this now, nowadays. Uh, in, in the next few months, or perhaps in, the, in next year, we're going to have something, real uh, use cases, uh, uh, to show and to demonstrate that uh, these new technology are useful and for me it's very important thinking from the spy point of view so finally coordination 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 unless you have if you have a, a lot of money you don't need to to uh, speak with others you do what do you want to do okay but this is not the case so be famous open your data uh, 
use uh, your resources for providing more intelligent geographic uh, information, forget the maps. Well, not forget, but uh, leave aside. Pursue your customers to use your inspired services, your inspired download service, and if you are able to do it, please tell me how to do it, okay? Uh, Google, OpenStreetMap, Bing, they are allies or they are opponents. We have to think the, the role of these key uh, actors. And finally, uh, last but not least, 3D vector tile semantic web inside or outside inspire. I prefer inside inspire. Okay? Thank you very much. Um, we're running just a little bit ahead of schedule, so um, if there's any, we can maybe take one or two quick questions, if anybody has any questions for Emilio. Oh, okay, great. Um, thanks. Oh. Um, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you very and much. comprehensive. Uh, I'd like to ask whether you have uh, data about human activities in the sea environment. Ooh, uh, it's a difficult uh, question because perhaps I, I, I am not the right person to answer this uh, because uh, the, the data from environment uh, is the people from the Ministry of Environment that should answer this question. I have to say, I, I am going to be very honest now because it's a pity that nobody from the Ministry of Environment in Spain is here. Is here, not in this room, in this conference. Okay, so I'm sorry, but I, I'm not the right person for answer this. That means that you don't provide any marine data from this uh, central mm -hmm. uh, geo portal, because I, I have seen this kind I of data, know. and I think that I've seen it from your uh, portal. Marine data? Yes. No. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know. No. Sorry. Yeah, any, any, more, any more questions? Maybe take one more. Okay, thanks. That's a really good, really good, really enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker this morning is not uh, Fabio Vinci, as was uh, billed. It's, in fact, uh, Giacomo Martirano. Um, And you're going to talk about the same thing, aren't you, uh, Giacomo? Yeah, yes. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ian. Hello. Uh, just to clarify, I'm another inspired hooligan. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Always in peace. By the way, I... I I sit close to Emilio, not only uh, physically, but just also in terms of perspectives. So the title of the presentation, jointly prepared with uh, my colleagues, uh, is uh, Inspired Data Usability Beyond Formal Conformance. What's new one year later? And you will understand better the meaning and the reason of this title uh, in the next slides. So there is some link between uh, time, so future, present, and past. The future. These are two uh, photos appeared on the on the on tweet uh, related to the uh, the opening plenary and the second plenary yesterday, given by the hierarchy of the GConnect of European Commission. Uh, Director General on the left. And on the second, uh, the, the, the madam on the, on the right in the, second, uh, in the second picture is the deputy head of unit of uh, data innovation and policy unit, if I'm not mistaken. Both of them said several times that data must be accessible, reusable, interoperable, hopefully open. To do what? To open up this marvelous market for poor entrepreneurs like us that are uh, assumed to make a lot of profit out of them. But they said very clearly, and I was happy to learn, that the future that is in their agendas, plans, programs, and so on, is relying on this sort of precondition. So finally, we see a future in front of us. 
But now, let's, so having this future in mind, let's make some, some step behind. In terms of conformance, I'm still using some, uh, some uh, tweets, more, uh, one of the most popular was one. I don't know if the popularity is counted in terms of likes and retweets, but if so, I'm happy. This is a counter uh, on our stand saying that someone uh, joked uh, saying is the end of the world, is the next Christmas, is basically the, uh, 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 the next uh, crucial deadline in the Inspire roadmap, the 23rd of November, the picture was taken two years ago, by the way, so the clock works properly, related to the uh, deadline for the provision of Annex 1 data set fully conformant to whatever can have to be conformant against. It's not a, a, a stressing message, uh, as some tweets uh, jokes apart they highlight it, but it's just a reminder that time is, is, is approaching. And what we are talking about in terms of formalities, the deadline is that one, and uh, literally states that by 23rd November, all spatial datasets shall be conformant to implementing rule, the 1089 and subsequent uh, amendments. Metadata uh, for including uh, in metadata for interoperability and available through network services. Even though most of the of the, uh, I think that since the beginning of this roadmap, all the uh, data uh, providers or responsible parties were looking at this last deadlines in the roadmap, honestly, we have to say that there were also previous deadlines related to newly collected data set and so on, but let's, let's focus on this. This is the last call. Eh? We don't know what will happen uh, after, not the end of the world, of course, but from the formal point of view, there is an effort, this is an increasing effort to try to respect this deadline with all the difficulties that there are behind. Let's have a look at today. This morning, I tried to make the most updated uh, search on the, uh, on the current version of the Inspired Geoportal using the web browser functionality. I made an exercise to find the resources discoverable in the Inspired Geoportal. So in terms of datasets, because you know there are also uh, series and services, and so today, 93,008 datasets are discoverable. We know that the mechanism to retrieve this data depends on if at that time some of the, some of the national geoportal are not harvestable and so on, but this is, this is a figure, at least comparable with the next. Of these, 12,721 are related to Annex 1. And of these, 1,065 declared, self-declared, to be conformant, okay, in Europe today. This is the situation today. So please, let's make a, a step behind. The first slide, DigiConnect says that us as entrepreneurs to make business, we need data accessible, usable, interoper interoperable, equal, inspired, compliant, I guess you can agree with me. So we are today speaking about these uh, uh, facts. But this is not enough, eh? because we are saying that uh, we want to check the usability beyond the formal conformance. We are speaking about the formal conformance. <coughs> so what's new one year uh, later? Last year, at the Inspire Conference 2016, in the session Technologies and Tools Required to Deliver Inspire, today we are in thinking out of the box session, there was an, an, a presentation given by us, Inspire Data Usability Beyond Formal Conformance, and we outlined these three main barriers last year. Impacts of metadata editing on data discovery, impacts of correct encoding option on data display in GIS environment, so in terms of usability, and the impact, impacts on the so-called low committed mapping on data exploitation by user communities. Because in our opinion, a low committed mapping have a strong impacts, negative impacts on data exploitation and usability by user communities. Do you believe that these three barriers have been uh, taken over during the last year? I don't think so. Because even in the, in the initial workshop, I learned that uh, we are still uh, facing problems in metadata editing because if we don't 
edit properly metadata, discoverability will, will never happen. And just to, what, just to make a, a glance of what we are talking about, this was a picture and a, a snapshot of a, of a, a screenshot of, of a metadata resource, uh, a metadata of a data set last year, in which we are particularly referring to the, to the resource abstract in which a lot of information is provided. About the lineage, we are talking about uh, uh, free text fields, eh? resource abstract. In order to be conformant, you can just uh, put a space and you are okay. But if you want to support the discoverability of your data, you have to, 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 to tell a story here. Lineage is a bit short, but it's very important. And now no more text-free fields, because now we are speaking about other uh, things. In the resource locator field, here you see three uh, uh, links working all of them. The first one is the, providing the link to the data set provide uploaded to the AUNet. Uh, and then the last one is, the, uh, is a link to download a GML um, 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 compliant data set. Of course, we know, all of us, that the best would be to have here an endpoint of a WFS to, to, to play properly with the resource, but this was a good example. There are other examples that I discovered very often in which there are uh, URL websites in, a, in, a, in with maybe no translation in English, so we are lost in finding the resources. You see very simple uh, recommendations. And look at this. This stuff here is an excerpt from an habitat and biotope. That's just an example. We can find many examples. This forgive me, this shitty stuff, <laughs> passes schema validation. So tell me, a poor entrepreneur, which kind of business can make, can make out of it? Huh? The, 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 the impacts of misused voidable attributes on data exploitation by user communities. So let's please use um, uh, voidability in a proper way only when we don't know or we are not in the position to give information but when we have just not skip it, because otherwise everything, the, the, the chain is blocked. So let's come up today. I will be uh, here now very, very, very short because many other uh, presenters in the past gave more uh, uh, advanced uh, announcements uh, than, than us. But, but the, the importance of uh, persistent identifiers is extremely important as also uh, um, Gabriele Vajid mentioned yesterday in his presentation when he showed how the, the, uh, the, the catalogs of spatial data with a catalog of open data can, can, can uh, link each other. So, basically the creation of PIDs for the uh, spatial objects is one of the most crucial challenges in the implementation of Inspire and they are essential for the reuse of Inspire data by other communities. The implementers have to guarantee that the identifiers refer unambiguously to the same resources over time, otherwise we got crazy. And a lot of best practices need to be shared among different actors, uh, institu European institutions setting rules for namespaces, for instance, or other things aiming to the definition of commonly agreed encoding rules. Otherwise, these, uh, even though we discovered the data set, their re reusability is really poor. And how this can happen if we don't make a good, a good, a good job before? This is just a, 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 snapshot, a screenshot of a, of a transformation with L Studio, in which we have basically GML ID, which is mandatory required by GML specifications, GML identifier, which is optional foreseen by GML specifications, and Inspire ID, which is mandatory required by Inspire, but we know that for some of the Annex 3, this is not uh, even mandatory. But these are the three key elements that we have to play with. And we have to, 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 to some software do some random assignments to these values and reusability will be lost. So there are uh, references, um, all of them referring to providing uh, 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 good recommendations how to, to deal with this important issue. And we, just an example, we, we, we made also um, an exercise uh, to, to, to use what the uh, 
conceptual, uh, generic conceptual data model annex, uh, I don't remember if F of G or whatever, uh, of D to 5 on Inspire is uh, recommending because don't forget that technical guidelines, even though they are not uh, legally binding, they provide a lot of information that can be very useful to achieve reusability. Eh? Don't forget this. And we simply then applied it to a to, 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 um, test example to see how it, it, it can work. At the end, the, the output of the transformation is something like that with, with respect to the previous uh, excerpt. Now it has a meaning behind it. It, 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 it is the precondition to uh, reusability in the sense that we are uh, aiming at. In terms of persistent identifiers, uh, I think on Wednesday was the, this session there were very, two very interesting presentations that I had the, 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 the opportunity to attend. And so from this one by uh, Sorin uh, Ruzu of TeamNet, I just took two slides highlighting data with meaningful identifiers and the need for smart identifiers in our data. So um, uh, he provided also uh, an advanced uh, um, view on how, how to properly deal with the same issue and also by uh, uh, Francisco Lopez that uh, uh, um, developed a national persistent identifier management system in Spain, providing a lot of, of, uh, good, uh, of good examples to, um, to, to make this happening. So the, the, at the conclusion of, uh, of, my, of my speech is that there are many examples that, for instance, that, that we, we know that we have troubles with uh, with many tools not uh, yet capable to deal with um, displaying complex features coming from network services and so on, but there was also a workshop practicing practical on Inspire. So a lot of stuff is coming uh, up and, uh, and uh, it's very important to, to, to rely on it, to, to keep updated on it, but extremely important in order to make the, the content of the first slide happening Please, let's make Inspire working first as a precondition of every kind of success with the exploitation of data that we used, we heard so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giacomo, and thanks for, thanks for keeping to the timetable. Um, are there any questions for Giacomo? Well, it's, uh, it's more a comment. Uh, I agree with uh, many things that Giacomo said, but uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not. I'm a technical person, but uh, very often I think there is a communication I problem. Yeah, exactly. I think there is a communication problem. I read formal compliance. Sometime in uh, news there is official compliance. There is not such a definition, as far as I know. Uh, those are all non-legally binding. So. I get a lot of, by experience, a lot of questions, and people, users get very focused on that, and the result of that is you have no data. You have all void. So nobody can use anything. So I think validation is good, but just focus on making something useful. Yeah, I fully, I fully agree with you. Any more questions for Giacomo? Okay. Um, thanks very much again. Our next presentation this morning is from Efren Diaz, uh, who's going to talk about um, legal advice. Thanks, Efren. So, good morning. I'm a friend Diaz from Madrid. Uh, I'm a Spanish lawyer, a GML lawyer, as Emilio Lopez said. So uh, I would like to talk today about a uh, use case and also because we are here to think out of the box. If you want, we also can uh, fly on drones. Uh, why Why I would like to talk about this? Because I'm uh, I'm user, I'm lawyer. I would like to use my information uh, on legal issues. So, for to focus this, there are many many areas of interest in which we can work. Uh, of course, law is everywhere. Law is a helpful. 
tool in many things sometimes uh, and I think we have to practice a new advocacy in the 21st centuries, uh, in century in which uh, we, we are. We have to show the regulation of drones and we can fly through through these aspects seeing what happening uh, mainly in Spain but it's affecting the whole of Europe. We are in front of very uh, big regulatory changes on RPAs and we have to innovate the methodology of doing the legal things because we are not in the paper era anymore. So we have to move towards a new way of doing things. And for that reason, I think uh, using these new technologies as a way to solve uh, and to optimize legal and economic ways of doing, not only in an administrative way, also in judicial uh, procedures. Because in, when you are in court, you have to think very out of the box and think what is the conviction of the judge. For this reason, I think, uh, for instance, drones is a significant help for our work. Uh, the object of this uh, presentation is show you uh, different practical application, what is the current uh, legality in this field, and also no new standards, f uh, present you a real case and get some uh, conclusions that can be helpful for you and to help us to know where we are in this uh, working. Well, first of all, I think we, it's very important to think not only technical, also legally. Why? Because we need fly legally. And for this reason, we have to know the current legislation. Let me to put an example. We have in Spain a pending legislation. We don't know what is the law to apply and to fly legally. <laughs> so that's crazy. Now we have a regulation of air circulation to be re uh, changed and, and modified. And also the whole area of technical stuff about drones has to be reframed from a legal perspective. So we cannot fly today <laughs> legally. Uh, so that's a bit crazy, but it doesn't really matter. So now we have also to know a bit what are the main uh, obligations of uh, operators in this area, because we have to know that the characterization and the documentation of uh, drones flights are very important to know uh, things about the drones, but the legal implications of this are huge because from the documentation we have to know the legal implications which are big and it can it make conditions about operating aircraft, necessary properties for a work to be developed. Be developed. So w here we have also to know this big thing about aeronautical safety study, just to be in technical matter as Technical, uh, you know, I'm lawyer, but I have to go inside of this uh, before get the drone on the land to fly. <laughs> so uh, I can be uh, suitability of the flight safety zone. I have to know where I have to fly, and also the legal implications and move on on that quality, accuracy, precision, and specification of work and information is huge. Put a camera on a drone is a very helpful thing to get a very good information uh, and we also can use that as legal proof of the equipment and the information generated is very important and the added value of that is big. And finally, the admissibility of administrative and judicial evidence depends on this uh, documentation and implications from the technical perspective. So thinking in a big way about INSPIRE, this is very, very helpful for us. Uh, I'm also a bit inspired hooligan, but in fact I'm a geoinformation hooligan <laughs> and fan, and I'm a l Spanish lawyer fan on geoinformation. Also my, my PhD <laughs> is about that, so I'm uh, really concerned about that. But also come on to see uh, the black part of this story, because we have to take care about the insurances policy uh, against damages, but also know how the civil administrative and other kind of responsibilities are at the back of this. Also, uh, we can have a huge problem if we use, imagine, a bad drone and this invalidate the evidence in court. Imagine if you are the owner and they say, well, this is not your land because a, a drone or geoinformation error is, it could be crazy. So uh, that is also a, a, a new area of work and we have to see how is the implications of the things that I'm going to talk now about it because it's affecting a uh, cross-border and trans-European with the new privacy uh, regulation. 
So protection of privacy is very important when you fly with drones, but also know the other kind of rights that are implied on that. Those are out of the box of the geo information, so it's very important to think a bit about it. And personal data protection becomes a new barrier about the use of this thing. For that uh, reason, the new GDPR is into force yet and is going to be fully applicable next year in May. So the approach of this new European regulation, which is going to be applied direct to each country, is this approach based on risk assessment. So we have to be very concerned about that. All of these uh, fast points are used to start to fly. We are still on land. We have to take off and to see why uh, fly legally is so important uh, for us as lawyers, not just as the owner of the drone, of course. So the legal value of the information for me is huge and it's really important. My experience in court in an administrative processes is great because you can see how is the conviction of the public administration of, or the judge when you can put a image more than a thousand words in front of them. For this reason, I think uh, we need a fly legally, but knowing all the stuff which is in, involved on that applications, uh, because the application of the legal information is to be presented on a public administration and, and court. Also, we have to know the operations. We have to prepare and do and realize everything very carefully. Otherwise, all the work we are doing can be very well done technically, but very awful legally. And finally, we have to guarantee certain things like security, compliance with legal standards and safety, uh, technical, organizational and legal measures should be adopted about that. So also now we need to see some limitations to fly because sometimes people think you can fly freely, but in many, in many of these points, safety and, and the fundamental rights of to data protection becomes a huge limitation. Also, quality and accuracy of flight class is very important to develop all the work. And the, let me to put a bit of detail on the new GDPR because can help you to, uh, as producer or manager of geo information to show how important is becoming this 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 rule because we have now to do a, an impact assessment on the privacy of flights operation before fly we also have to comply with many obligations and third parties uh, in imply on the in this regulation and also the risk approach become a very huge thing before do anything why because the specific risk and Please, because here there is people from different organizations. This is a, a key point on the regulation. I, for that reason, I put in, in that letters. The European new regulation consider a risk this mass treatment that affect large numbers and of affected person or involve the collection of a large amount of personal data. So massive processes means risk. So that's huge because you are processing millions of data. Some, some things to consider are many, but finally my purpose is be advised on this because it's not always clear how you can do with the work with these things. And now the regulation present a new standard, which is this proactive responsibility of operator. Uh, specify on that lot of things, mainly the new obligation to, the, to nominate the data protection officer, which is a person who study all these things. The need for a specific legal advice is so clear, but because of the different scenarios in which we are going to work, it's very important that you have on your mind the concerns that you have to be advised. Otherwise, in a lot of legal things, you can be uh, lost. But uh, for me, uh, this is important not as theory. Become to see now practice uh, things to, to end. Practical applications are a lot. Let me to put here a lot of words where you can have a lot of practical application of law. Uh, also, areas now uh, that are cu uh, currently under development, big data, Internet of Things. So f the conclusion and the clear idea is 
here we have the infrastructure of all the information is transversal to everything we have to do and the, the role of the lawyers here i think we have to see in two main roles the preventive and advisory role which is very important in all those projects IT projects to avoid uh, con bad consequences and also the litigious role to defend what you have, to defend your applications, to defend your developments, your IT developments. Because finally here there is the benefits of civilian use of drones because they allow the use of these things. But where I'm talking about drones, hear me geo information. I'm not mm, seller of drones. <laughs> I'm just a user, a fan user of uh, drones or any technology that can, can help me to solve this. So this is a GML real case. I'm a GML lawyer. Uh, thank you, Emilio. So why all that, the, all that thing? Come on to see that. So I received a call. A client said, I have a big problem. I bought a, a land, a piece of land, and the, the topographical, cadaster, and registry areas are different. It's not a joke, it's a reality. So we have to move into that to try to solve that. So the first thing is like when you have a patient in a hospital, you have to see what happened. So what happened? Many, many different problems before that, particular circumstances very, very bad uh, deal with, with, with it. Difficult collaboration with the neighboring owners was <laughs> classical problem. And here is not so classical, but becomes classical. Lot of errors in traditional measurements. Crazy. So I have two dimensions of my problems. First of all, technical dimension was the proper area, what's correct. And second, the legal dimension. I have to clarify the administrative procedures, previous done, and also clarify the proper areas. So I have to move into that and say how I can solve this problem because I am lawyer. So I'm thinking more in solutions than in problems. So going in this way, I say, well, two lines of work. Traditional line is the typical line, classical one. What happened? Traditional uh, methodology, deed of property, cadastral information, but incorrect. The GML, everything that cadastral is doing, at least in that point, was not very well done. And the certification of real estate was a mess, nothing to be used and of course non-legal interoperable uh, and of course not technologically interoperable paper i don't like paper um, i like gmls so um, second line of solution so i started to work about that and say well i need to have the physical representation of real estate here is the detail but come on to fly uh, to these things so i would like to know what's real second I would like to have certainty on topographic reality. I would like to know what is the floor, I'm on it. And from this reason, everything and legal consequences be, could become clear. So finally, uh, we decide this difficult thing. So the things done before, I don't mind. So go ahead, think out of the box and uh, feasibility of the technical and topographical world. Trust on what drones is going to get. That's it. So come on to fly. And then uh, we've, we believe in the legal efficiency and the optimization of, the, of legal interoperability. I use that principle from the year 2012 and say, well, legal interoperability of the information is a very helpful tool to deal with my legal stuff, like a toy, like a good thing to work with it, to get all the technical stuff in which create what I would like to do in my administrative and judicial processes. So come on to play with that. So three objectives. I would like to identify what I wanted to do. I would like to visualize it. And of course, here there are necessary export to Gmail files. Please, I need to work with that. I need be full legal interoperability with cadaster and land registry. How and with, with, with Gmails, Gmail lawyers. Uh, so, after that, we design all the process, technical legal solution, collaborative work, and we, I'll put together these people, my lawyers, Masi Calvet in Madrid, 
the technicians and the data loaders and spatial data. So we establish the job planning with all that detail, like to get the flight, get the information and use that information properly, precise and accurate to go to the cadastre and land registry. So finally, was here, interoperable, interoperable visualization of new information. I wanted to ensure the legal interoperability of that, of that new information, uh, facilitate access and processing to technicians and laws, both, not only technician, I would like to know and see and validate by myself the Gmails, each one, because it's my responsibility after that, and come on display platform to work uh, on the top of it, use a private geo portal for us. So finally, we, we search display was done, everything was worked very well, we got cartography from public bodies, necessary cartography, GS big resolution, uh, D here again, DXF and Gmail format to work with it and measure well all what the work you you clear know about that and finally we've got the cadastral and registry coordination working with that a cadastral thematic topography cartography you help us to present and to put on it the Gmails we eliminate the duplication in the land registry and finally we we've, we've got the physical and cadastral coordination and here. Uh, we were using what in the Spanish law, as Emilio said before, the alternative georeference graphical representation, which is see the image and not the words, and this works very well. Finally, at the bottom, my principle, my good, well, my idea, legal interoperability of information, which is huge, important in, in this point. So for me, the main legal information is the first case uh, to use uh, drones to get the information precisely, real graphic validation not only uh, through technicians and finally the legal coordination through all the different levels of uh, processes we have to deal with that. So some conclusions, uh, legal files should be also be technical, reduction of economic costs and exchange of information thanks to the Gmail formats and inspired and fully compliant uh, formats, accessibility to common sources, mainly public cartography and other sources like that, and also the optimization of actions to be carried out by juries from previous geospatial information. So our floor is the G information, is not the cloud of you never know what happening in cadastre and land registry. And uh, I think uh, drones and legality can be uh, possible. Also, I think I'm firmly convinced about this. G information on hands of good technicians like you and on hands of lawyers can move and can help us to think out of the box and sometimes fly to another step in the use of the G information uh, in this new uh, European environment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Efren. Um, I think that it's a presentation that was well outside the box. Really fascinating. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Efren? Um, I think we'll probably have to move quite quickly if we're going to finish at 12.30. Oh, there is one. Thank you. Is there a, a specific provision in the law about, about legal interoperability in the Spanish law? Yes. Uh, in the year uh, 2010, we work uh, on the Spanish SDI law in, to transpose into the Spanish legislation the Inspire Right Directive. And I think on, on the top of that, in the year 2015, the Article 10 of the new Spanish land registry regulation said a historical thing in Spain. The base of the land registry the basic, the graphic base of the land registry will be the cadastral cartography. For me, that is huge and very relevant because it's the first time in the Spanish story after two centuries of separation institution uh, when the cartography will help the, the, the land registry activity through a technical coordination. I think, because Antonio is here, is the, ex the, the success of the INSPIRE implementation on an institutional legal agreement. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, FN, thank you very much. Our, our final speaker this, after, this afternoon is Roberta Luce um, from Ezra. He's going to talk about Inspire Implementation Ideas Fostering Adoption and Use. Oh, thanks, Roberto. You're welcome. I don't know what that is. Thank you. Um, I work for ESSE. I've been working in ESSE since 2009. Uh, we do provide technology to users. Uh, and in particular, I've been working on Inspire, helping implementing Inspire. We do apply uh, and promote the science of where. So that's why for us, the use of the data is as important as uh, sharing the data. So I'd, I'd like to start with the experience we gathered and then the way we think we are, we should be moving forward. Uh, so if you look at, um, for those familiar, these are all the different implementation options. The, some would say non-legally binding, but some would say, yeah, but it would be nice to have it, uh, or we have to have it. So there is always this endless debate. But uh, as you can see, to remove the debate, we actually implemented all the options. And, uh, but uh, again, we started it years ago, and what I'd like to share here is uh, what we learned. So for many years, and that's why I wanted to make the comment, uh, right after Giacomo's presentation is, this was the only question I was receiving for seven years. Are you compliant? Can you provide the certificate? There is no certificate, first of all. There is no official validator, second of all. There are so many things. This is not legally binding. So please understand this first of all. But regardless, so as a second thought on this, this was the real only question that I, I was receiving and my colleagues were receiving. So what have we learned over time? So I started in 2007. I was actually at JRC at the time. And then uh, there was uh, seven years later, there was a midterm review, and they say, yes, it's still good. If we didn't have Inspire, we should have it. And uh, because the goal of sharing data and using, making uh, easy to use shared data is still a very important goal. So uh, the following Inspire conference, um, there was a plenary, and in the plenary uh, that is recorded in YouTube, so you can watch it, if you are interested, I was very excited to be there and listen to this statement because they were saying, we need to move to use. Complexity and benefit must be uh, in balance, okay? So all these keywords were exciting me because I didn't hear before, so it took seven years. Uh, but it, it was exciting me and many others who were looking for how to use Inspire. But to be honest, since today, there's been little progress on that, um, uh, in my opinion. And um, so as what if session has been, uh, inv we were invited to uh, contribute. And as again, as I said, for us is more about using the data and applying the geospatial data, the science of where we contribute by saying, what if actually success is not compliance, but looks like adoption? Right? What if it's actually used? Because there is an end goal in 2021 that looks like a great goal where you should open champagne and celebrate. What do we celebrate? Okay? So this is the main, the main point here and, and the thoughts that we wanted to share. And um, th this, this, I hope, uh, will, will be a collaborative conversation uh, that we run actually since Monday. So, and then there is another article just before the conference on GIM that says, yes, many benefits, but you know, they use REST for the users. So you can see between the lines that there is some benefits and also some discussion about how to really decouple or reconsider some of the technical specifications here. So for example, can you make this real? Nice paper that says 14 or many sustainable development goals can be built out of Inspire. Do you see an example? Can you foresee that in 2020? I'm not optimistic. 
And so this is why we are, and this is just one example. We, this is why we are trying to move to what is needed to be adopted and usable uh, rather than purely compliant. Formal compliance, official compliance, non-legally binding, we can discuss forever, but I think we all share the goal of making this as a usable and successful platform. So most of the specs you see in the technical guidance are at least 10 years old. And there is an OGC article on geospatial war that says 10 years is an eternity. And I think I agree. Um, so you can see here plenty of keywords. Yesterday in the plenary, you see BMW sensors, and you think about GML um, and WFS, uh, there is some discrepancy there. At the same time, at any public government level, city of a thousand people from the European level, there is an open data movement. So open data uh, has been introducing a slightly different approach. It's not wiping out the Inspire approach, for example, but is very much bottom-up, is actually organic. There is collaboration, city, government, is not, is not necessarily hierarchical. And um, how do they deal with exploitation? How do they create room for innovation? They very well decouple data from services and applications. So they, uh, I think Copernicus is a very good example of this. I've seen FAO, I've been working with FAO to build vegetation indexing for, for Pakistan or Afghanistan out of Copernicus. You just go in the European Space Agency Data Hub, Science Hub, you grab the data and you use it. And you're using your preferred technology. So I think there is a, already a very good example that we can all look at at the European level. Plenty of examples at regional, local levels. Uh, Inspire is great, Inspire is big, it's not the only thing, and it will never be, in my opinion. And uh, so this is another way to look at uh, geographic scales or different programs. So Inspire, Copernicus, GEOS, your national initiative, not everything fits here. Um, the census, SDGs, and so on will all be available on the web, if not already, and any user will likely need or want to have access to all of them. There is no, I need to find everything in Inspire or everything in Copernicus. So we need to enter in this mindset where this is a IoT environment where there is no hierarchy and there is no a single environment. <coughs> so what, what we call WebJS, is the platform that connects everyone. So we heard in the plenary there shouldn't be a back-end system that the organization uses or the public government uses, and then another system separate from it that the government wouldn't even know how to use it, but others uh, are asked to find out how to use it. So this is essentially the same platform that serves the people, the, the organization itself, other governments and communities. Um, this is the reality. Every problem likely will need some, if not all of this, right? So without going back to the plenary, I think we all acknowledge this. So 3D, Emilio mentioned 3D, vector data, tabular data, need to enable tabular data on um, zip code, addresses, and so on. So the apps has to be able to do this. And this is how we design RJS. Uh, what is WebJS is a system of system architecture. There are open APIs, different data models. It doesn't really matter. This is just by experience. It's uh, proven that this can be done. The RJS platform uh, represent all these. And if we look at this, this is representing what we learned so far. So when we say a complete system is because we hear questions like the one I've heard in this session, like we need to know what the user is doing. How do you do that? Do you think they need to log in? Do you think that you need to have them signing anything? I think the most proven to work um, model is to have a system of engagement where they can leave comments, where they can correct the data, where they can send the feedback about the school name is being updated, the street address is no longer like this, it's being updated in six months ago. So you need to have a system, we call it hub, 
that provides not just the access to the data, but also the participatory tools. And our feedback, our surveys, I can activate a survey myself. If I think my district is too dark at night, I can create a survey using the same platform. And I can provide this collection of signatures back to the government. So this is the model we are building. And uh, on the left, lower left, you see systems of record. So that's, for example, Inspire. So Inspire provides a system of record with authoritative data, hopefully good data. And this is why a system of engagement is important, because if Giacomo is not happy, we'll have a tool to say, where can I really find anything about habitat and biotopes be beyond compliance, right? It's compliant, thank you very much. I only read tags and no data, Empty right? Box. Empty boxes. So this is where, and which one do you do first? Right? What is the priority? There is tons of work. So this is why the participatory system of engagement model helps you and citizen to uh, prioritize, for the citizen to know what you are doing, and for the government to know what is the priority. And then on the lower right, there is RGS Insights. This is being designed to address the data scientist needs. So those who are willing to go beyond the data as it is, but find correlation. So there are applications in health, <coughs> from demographic data and cancer, and many other applications that you can imagine um, that will help data scientists to find correlation between uh, cause and effect. These are examples. There are plenty of open source API and tools that you can use, but you see how we classified. So are for the organization, field operators or citizen, if they are in the office or in their home office, if they are in the community. So each of them, you can see here, crowdsourcing polling, uh, quick report, photo survey. You can just take a photo and send the photo as a feedback in, in, uh, in the system. And again, this is not uh, academic, this is not theory. This is, for example, just the statistics about the software as a service solution. It's not what each organization does on their own servers, but you can see here more than four million users actually use this every day. So it's not theoretical, it's working. And you see on the right, some standards mentioned, OGC, WMS, WMTS, WFS, KML. We see statistics on this, and this is why we are taking actions. So typically, at least an app, each, if, you, if we average an app in RGS Online, 10% of them use one, at least one WMS layer. So we acknowledge that WMS is a good standard, is proven to be useful. WFS less than 0 0.01, okay? So it's just a fact, more than 4 million users. And uh, so we are moving by selecting those against the usability. So it's just a very practical way to respond to user needs. And Emilia has mentioned uh, vector tiles. I, I totally agree, it's not a standard, but it's a de facto standards, and those are, if proven to be useful, if proven to be uh, implemented by multiple vendors, why not consider those if they are providing benefits, right? And I won't go further on vector ties, but there are plenty of benefits. So this is another way to look at the hub, is one single system for the government and the community. Vision Zero here is an example from uh, Sweden, they set a goal, an initiative that uh, aims at uh, reducing to zero the number of deaths as car accident on the road. And how do they do that? How do they monitor and how do they educate the uh, citizen is through uh, the initiative planning and, and the maps. So moving forward, I added something on, on the finish line over there, 2021. Uh, is complete and used. So this is our goal. We, we wish that we can claim that 2021, the platform is not just compliant, but is also used. Um, and the way we are planning to do this is select implementation options that provide clear exploitation plans. So we may not implement some of these. Hosted service, the 99.9% .9 
100% availability is not a joke. It requires people in the weekend, at night. So it's very important. I think we all get upset if your email doesn't work, or internet in general, doesn't work for two minutes. And we need to take this seriously if this is an infrastructure, right? So we need to think about uh, hosted service that are really 99.9% .9 available. Um, a road doesn't disappear and reappear or, or, and so on. Um, and we think that uh, we heard a lot during the conference about in the plenary especially about open data and inspire. We think the efforts should be combined. So we are seeing a lot of parallel efforts and implementation from the same organization. Uh, and we think it should conflate in one, if possible. That's, that's something that may not be always be applicable, but we think uh, is, is a good idea. And room for innovation. There are plenty of ideas, vector ties is one, being using soft guidelines like mentioned by other uh, the, the colleagues from the DG communication, I think. Uh, I think that's another way to go. And again, this is just uh, our wish. We shouldn't just talk about this, we should do it. And I think, um, I think uh, there is almost horizontal consensus as I walk in different meeting rooms, as I talk to different people, that these are things that should happen. We shouldn't just say, yes, I agree. We should say, yes, we do it. And uh, this is uh, it's not a necessary specific effort. It should be a collective effort. So this is, uh, we are willing to give our contribution, but I think this has to be something that we don't simply acknowledge, but we actually take action on it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto, for another very, very interesting uh, presentation. Are there any questions for Roberto? I thought I saw a hand go up. Okay, right, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, just to sum up, um, I, I, I think that the, the threads that I've, uh, I've noted um, running through the presentations uh, this morning were that there's, there's, there's something around the, the role of government and when government should step in, um, uh, but also there's a balance against what y users needs um, and um, just identifying users generally. Um, thanks, thanks very much. And thanks very much to Desiree for managing the room today. Cheers. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch and I'll, I'll be back here at 2 o'clock if anybody's interested in more thinking out of the box.